Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News R, India's Voice to the World. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj, coming up in the next hour. At least 115 people killed, over 145 injured in one of the deadliest attacks at a concert hall in Moscow. 11 alleged suspects detained. Prime Minister Modi returns to Delhi after a successful visit to Bhutan. Earlier inaugurated a state-of-the-art hospital built with India's assistance in Timfu. Hospital, a shining example of India-Bhutan partnership. U.S. Congress averts government shutdown, passes $1.2 trillion bill. Key federal agencies will remain funded through September 30th. And Punjab Kings win toss and opt to field against Delhi Capitals in match two of the Indian Premier League cricket tournament. One of the deadliest attacks in Moscow, over 100 people were killed and over 145 injured after the gunmen opened the fire at the concert hall. The fire started with huge plumes of black smoke rising over the buildings, which can hold several thousand people and has hosted top international artists. Russian authorities now focus on providing help to the people. Meanwhile, 11 people suspected of carrying out the attacks have been detained even as the search for others who are believed to be at large continue. The governor of the Moscow region, Andrei Vorobyov, described the Friday's concert hall attack as a tragedy. He said that an operational headquarters has been set up. This is a tragedy. The burning area is very obvious. Firefighters are working hard on site. Further information will be released once the firefighters conclude their work. Investigators found weapons and other evidence after camouflage clad gunmen opened fire at concert goers near Moscow on Friday. The Russian investigative committee released footage of a rifle lying on the ground and staff examining spare gun magazines and spent bullet casings at the 6,200-seat Crocus City Hall in Krasnogorsk, where the attack occurred. And DD India correspondent Dasha Chernyshova joins us live from Moscow for more details. Dasha, there have been around 11 suspects detained so far in one of the deadliest attacks there in Moscow. And we can see the visuals here on the screens. They're scary. What is the current situation in the Russian capital and what are the authorities saying? Well, the security situation has been relatively calm here around Kwago City Hall after the fire has been taken under control. That allowed the recovery teams to get inside Kwago City Hall. And this is when they started to recover the bodies of the people who were trapped inside. Uh, some of them are believed to have been hiding from the gunmen and they later on died in the uh, rooms that are normally reserved for the staff as well as in the WC. So the dust toll has rapidly increased to 115. And then the governor of the Moscow region, Alexei Varavyov, said that this will be rising quickly. Certainly as the recovery effort is ongoing, they are recovering more bodies under the rubble. Now, speaking of the situation in terms of the investigation, the Russian authorities say they have found and detained 11 people who are believed to have been involved into this act of terrorism. Four of them have been directly involved. Uh, they are said to have been uh, present at the time of the uh, shooting. We uh, have seen some videos released by social media, including some state-run social media, suggesting that one of the men has been interrogated and said he was forced to kill people in exchange for money. The authenticity of this video is yet to be established, but it is believed that the uh, that the uh, terrorists have tried to escape by taking a Renault car and driving all the way from the Krokus City Hall here in Moscow to the border with Ukraine in the Bransk region where FSB says they have 
wanted to cross it and to get to Ukraine. They say that these perpetrators had contacts on the Ukrainian side. Again, the investigation is ongoing. We're waiting for more details because obviously there are many questions among the Russian public, including as to how the terrorists managed to uh, get to the border with Bransk, to the border with Ukraine, to the Bransk region so quickly. All right, Dasha. Uh We've heard that all the events lined up in the nearby areas uh, where the attack took place have been cancelled. Could you verify that and uh, updates on the purpose of this deadly attack? Any statement from the intelligence agencies or senior officials for that matter? I can't hear you, Dasha. I, I can hear you. Okay, you, you may continue, Dasha. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, so we haven't heard much from the Kremlin on the uh, on their reaction to what has happened, aside from the fact that the Russian president is updated on the course of the investigation by the heads of the, uh, the Russian ministries. Now, we also understand that the public events have been cancelled in the Russian capital, mm. uh, all the sports events, all the entertainment events. This is because of security measures, but also as Russians do seem to be mourning the death of so many people in the Russian capital. The same situation in many other uh, regions across Russia, but obviously security situation at the moment is paramount and we understand that at the airports as well as at the rail uh, road stations, the security checks have intensified. And also on the metro, we understand that the security has been scrutinized as well. All right, we leave it there and we'll keep taking updates from you, Dasha, on the same. Thank you so much for joining in and thanks for your analysis. Now, world leaders expressed shock and extended condolences to victims of shooting near Moscow in Russia. Condemning the attack, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi said India stands in solidarity with the government and the people of the Russian UN chief leaders from EU, Turkey and other world leaders too extended messages of solidarity with people of Russia in this hour of grief. Attack near Moscow at concert goers on Friday brought back the memory of 2004 Beslan school siege. The five gunmen dressed in a camouflage on Friday opened fire with automatic weapons at people at a concert in the Crocus City Hall near Moscow. Kremlin said Russian President Vladimir Putin was updated on the concert attack by FSB director. Putin wished a speedy recovery to those injured in the attack. Soon, global condemnation and messages of solidarity poured in. UN chief, United States and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, among others, condemned the attack and sent their condolences. The images are just horrible um, and uh, just hard to watch. And our thoughts, obviously, are going to be with the, the victims of this terrible, terrible shooting attack. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his social media post on X said that we strongly condemn the heinous attack in Moscow. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the victims. India stands in solidarity with the government and the people of the Russian Federation in this hour of grief. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned in the strongest possible terms. According to a statement attributable to Deputy Spokesperson Farhan Hug, the UN Secretary General said the Secretary General conveys his deep condolences to the bereaved families and the people of the government of the Russian Federation. He wishes those injured a speedy recovery. European Union spokesman Peter Stano in a statement posted on X said that EU is shocked and appalled by the reports of a terrorist attack in the Crocker City Hall in Moscow. The EU condemns any attacks against civilians. Our thoughts are with all those Russian citizens affected. Condemning the attack, French President Emmanuel Macron said in the statement that France stands in solidarity with the victims of the shooting. While German Foreign Office said that the images of the terrible attack on innocent people in Crocus City Hall near Moscow are horrific. The background must be investigated quickly. Our deepest condolences with the families of the victims. Following the attack, all entertainment and mass events were cancelled in Russia. A billboard near concert hall read a message, We Green. Following the attack, firefighters had to battle a massive blaze as flames leaped into the sky and plumes of black smoke rise 
rose above the venue. The emergency services evacuated hundreds of people while parts of the venue's roof collapsed. Islamic State has claimed the responsibility for the attack. Bureau report DD India. Moving on to the updates from Russia-Ukraine conflict, a person was killed and two others were wounded in a Ukrainian drone attack on Russia's Belgorod region. The drone attack damaged four buildings along with several vehicles. The Ukrainian forces also shot down 31 of the 34 attack drones launched overnight by Russia over parts of central, southern and southeastern Ukraine. On to another conflict. Israel said its forces fighting in Gaza have killed more than 170 terrorists during their days-long raid at the Al-Shifa hospital. The Israeli military earlier said the hospital was being used by Hamas to command terror operations against Israel. It also added that more than 350 Hamas and Islamic Jihad militants have so far been detained at the hospital. Meanwhile, eight parcels were airdropped over Gaza and delivering aid and relief materials. Also, the Israel's military has said that it had opened a new entry point for aid to enter Gaza and was allowing unlimited supplies into the enclave. But for now, countries such as the United States have sought to use airdrops and ships to deliver relief materials. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has arrived in Egypt border with Gaza on Saturday to renew pleas for a ceasefire. Guterres will visit Al Arish in the Egypt's northern Sinai, where much of the international relief for Gaza is delivered and stockpiled. He is also expected to visit a hospital in Al Arish and meet UN humanitarian workers in Rafah. His trip comes as Israel prepares to launch a major military operation in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. The UN Security Council vote on a new draft resolution that seeks an immediate ceasefire in Gaza has now been postponed for Monday. The vote will come after the United States put forward a text on the need for a ceasefire that was vetoed by Russia and China and opposed by Arab states on Friday. The draft resolution demands an immediate ceasefire for the ongoing Muslim holy month of Ramadan that leads to a permanent sustainable ceasefire respected by all sides. It also demands both the immediate and unconditional release of hostages seized in the October 7 attack by Hamas and humanitarian access in Gaza. The U.S. said its forces conducted self-defense strikes against three Houthi underground weapons storage facilities in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen on Friday. In a statement posted to X, U.S. Central Command said the strikes targeted capabilities used by the Houthis to threaten and attack naval and merchant vessels in the region. The forces also destroyed four unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs launched by Houthi in self-defense. All right, and still to come on DD Indian News R. Britain's Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, has announced she is being diagnosed with cancer. And dozens of Hong Kong people residing in Taiwan holds a protest against a new security law. down on corruption that the voters, the citizens of the country have been wanting and fighting for for decades or as the opposition claim an effort to cripple the opposition. Timing depends on the detection of the corruption. Then the timelines are fixed by the law. I will say the opposition has crippled itself. The manner in which they chose the timeline of response for all these notices that were coming to them. In ED when you are arrested, you are guilty until proven innocent. Now the twin condition is, the court cannot give you bail until you are innocent. But how will the court be innocent? Because you don't go to the facts of the matter in the bail hearing. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Britain's Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, has announced she's been diagnosed with cancer. It follows weeks of speculation about her health after abdominal surgery earlier in the year. 
On Friday, Kate said she was undergoing preventative chemotherapy after tests taken after she had major abdominal surgery in January revealed that cancer had been present. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. The news of cancer to Britain's Princess of Wales, Kate, dominated the front page of Britain's newspapers on Saturday. A number of UK's tabloids and broadsheets devoted entire front pages to the revelation. Rumours and gossip on social media in newspapers and even some US talk shows have abounded since Kate underwent abdominal surgery in January. She had taken a leave of absence from royal engagements while she recovered from the surgery. Meanwhile, messages of support poured from world leaders on social media after Kate's cancer diagnosis. US President Joe Biden posted on X that he joins millions around the world in praying for her recovery. Well, DD India's Oli Barrett joins us uh, with more details. Oli, certainly it's a very sad news uh, for everyone in the world, especially there in Britain. Uh, what is her recovery process right now and what's the latest you're getting for us? Yeah, we actually have no more detail about uh, Catherine's prognosis and her exact cancer diagnosis than we have from her video message. She talked about undergoing preventative chemotherapy. She talked mm -hmm. about being in the early stages of that treatment, um, but no more detail about exactly the type of cancer that she's being treated for, or indeed the exact type of chemotherapy that she is therefore undergoing at the moment. In terms of clues about her potential prognosis in that statement from Catherine, she does talk about telling her children that she is going to be okay, talks about focusing on making a full recovery. And uh, all of the word that we are getting from royal sources is that she is optimistic and uh, in good spirits. But she also makes that call for privacy in that video message, which we've heard repeated by uh, politicians here in the UK, uh, backing her up on that call for privacy for her and her family. Um, uh, and clearly there's going to be a lot of attention on Catherine in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, but what we don't know is um, how many, if any really, updates we're actually going to be getting from Kensington Palace on how Catherine is getting on with her treatment in the weeks ahead. Definitely, Oli, um, messages of support also pouring in from all around the world. Uh, US President Joe Biden has also, uh, you know, put out a tweet saying that, uh, you know, she's, uh, he's uh, praying for her speedy recovery. Uh, what else is happening? Uh, if you could just give us more details about, you know, who all are the world leaders who have been, you know, uh, showing their support towards this, towards her. Yeah, well, you mentioned that uh, message of support from uh, the U.S. President Joe Biden. There have been others flooding in from world leaders around the world. The French President Emmanuel Macron paying uh, tribute to Catherine um, uh, while wishing her well with her treatment. And here in the U.K., as you can imagine, um, uh, tributes are being paid and messages being sent by uh, politicians across the political spectrum, all of them uniting in showing their support for Catherine. But there's another element to it as well, which is that a lot of those messages from politicians here in the UK do criticise some of the media coverage of Catherine's health up to now, and also some of the conspiracy theories and rumour and gossip that have been circulating on social media. The opposition leader Keir Starmer here in the UK talking about the lurid mm. conspiracy theories and uh, uh, rumour on social media that have been going on. Uh, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak talked about what he called the unfair treatment that he th says that Catherine has been receiving from sections of the media and people uh, in online social media platforms. So that is a very clear 
clear uh, element to all of this now here in Britain is that many in politics are calling on people really yeah. to respect that call for privacy yeah. and to stop speculating online. One of the interesting things going forward will be how much we do see of Kate or otherwise. We had expected her to resume her royal duties after Easter, but that was before we knew about the cancer diagnosis. So one suspects that that full resumption, that full return to public life may now be further delayed. Definitely, Oli, and it's just the state of the mind being positive is the key. Thank you so much uh, for joining in. We also pray for her speedy recovery. Now, Slovaks began voting in a presidential election on Saturday, where polls are open in the first round of voting from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. A runoff between the top two candidates could also be due on April 6 if no one wins a majority in this one. Venezuela's opposition leader, Maria Corina Machado, has named Corina Yoris as her successor to take on President Nicolas Maduro in the country's presidential election in July. The naming of Yoris as the opposition's candidate comes after Venezuela's attorney general announced the detention of two Machado's closest allies earlier this week. She also said that arrest warrants have been issued for seven other people. In the U.S., more states are holding primary elections this weekend, including Louisiana and Missouri. Presumptive Republican candidate Donald Trump and Democrat current President Joe Biden don't have serious challenges left. But these elections are a chance to see how strongly voters in those states support him. Caroline Malone reports. Louisiana is a strongly Republican and Donald Trump supporting state. Their governor, Jeff Landry, is among them. Well, Trump won the state in the last presidential election in 2016 and 2020 with 58 percent of votes. He's likely to clinch Saturday's primary for the Republican Party with ease. Well, for the Democratic primary, there are options other than the current president, Joe Biden, which means they may take some votes away from him, including Marianne Williamson. Well, there are nearly three million registered voters in Louisiana, with just over a third of those turning up to vote in previous elections. Voting is open until 8 p.m. local time, with results due shortly afterwards. Well, on Saturday, there was also a Democratic primary in Missouri. Republicans already held their caucus there and chose Trump. For Democrats, there's also an uncommitted option on the ballot, so rather than choosing Biden as a sort of protest vote against his policy on Israel and concern over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And any kind of vote in that direction could signal how big a problem it continues to be for his campaign. Results there are due early next week. Well, there are now 149 days left until the Democratic National Convention, when Biden is likely to be officially nominated as their candidate, and 114 days until the Republicans hold theirs in Milwaukee. Caroline Malone in Washington for DD India. Meanwhile, U.S. lawmakers passed on Saturday a $1.2 trillion spending package to avoid a government shutdown. The budget bill will keep the government funded for the next six months until the end of the fiscal year. The vote on passage was 74 to 24. The U.S. Congress sent it to President Joe Biden to sign into law and avert a partial shutdown. Tonight, we have funded the government with significant investments for parents and kids and small businesses and health care workers, military families and so much more. It's no small feat to get a package like this done in divided government. These past few months have shown yet again that when bipartisan has room to work, we can get the job done. Update on Haiti now. As gang violence spreads across the North American nation, almost half of Haiti's people are struggling to feed themselves with several areas close to famine. According to the international organizations, inflation and poor harvests have also helped push Haiti to its worst levels of food insecurity on record. The Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, an organization which sets a scale used by the United Nations and governments to assess hunger, said in a report that about 4.97 million people out of a population of about 11.5 million were facing crisis or worse levels of food insecurity. Eight areas were now assessed to be in an emergency phase, the worst level before famine. White House spokesman John Kirby said that the Biden administration hopes to see movement in the coming days on selection of individuals to govern in Haiti. 
look, our lines of effort are really kind of three things right now. One is working with the Haitians on a Haitian-led political transition process. Um, and that, that presidential council, that, is, that transitional council is up and running. Number two, we're working with Kenya on a Kenyan-led multinational security support mission, which would not include U.S. Uh, uh, troops on the ground as part of that mission. And then thirdly, and this is, is clearly we're, we're doing what we can to help those Americans who want to leave Haiti get out safely. Let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's social media company Truth Social is set to become a publicly traded entity. Shareholders approved a merger to list Trump's social media venture on the stock market, potentially providing $3 billion to the ex-U.S. president on Friday, although he may not be able to access the funds for several months. Dozens of Hong Kong people residing in Taiwan held a protest against a new security law which critics say further threatens the China-ruled city's freedoms. The package, known as Article 23, punishes offences including treason, sabotage, sedition, the theft of state secrets, external interference and espionage with sentences ranging from several years to life imprisonment. Japanese citizens gathered at Chiba Prefecture to protest against the resumption of uh, Osprey flights after a flight of Osprey aircraft at uh, the Kisarazu base it flew in over three months since a U.S. Osprey aircraft carrying eight people crashed off Japan's southwestern island of Yakushima. And thousands of Thai devotees gathered at the Wat Bang Phra Temple near Bangkok to attend a spiritual tattooing ritual and pay respect to the revered tattoo master Luang Phor Pern, a spiritual tattooist who passed away in 2002 but still has a strong following, particularly during the annual ceremony. Chilean scientists have discovered a rare species of sea lilies in the Antarctic. A specimen was first sighted during an expedition by the Chilean Antarctic Institute to Vega Island in the Sea of Weddell in early January 2024. Sea lilies use their many arms to move through the water and to feed with floating particles. The species is considered a crinoid, an invertebrate from Echinodermata phylum. Well, still to come on the DD Indian News Hour. Indian naval ship Kolkata, which was deployed for anti piracy operations, arrives in Mumbai today with 35 Somali pirates on board. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar articulates that India has demonstrated a robust foreign policy approach amidst the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Stay tuned to get more details on this. Tensions escalates in South China Sea after China's Coast Guard takes steps against Philippine vessels. India that invents. India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. Watch India Ideas each Thursday, 8 p.m. only on TV India. real crackdown on corruption that the voters, the citizens of the country have been wanting and fighting for for decades or as the opposition claim, an effort to cripple the opposition. Timing depends on the detection of the corruption. Then the timelines are fixed by the law. I will say the opposition has crippled itself 
the manner in which they chose the timeline of response for all these notices that were coming to them. In ED when you are arrested, you are guilty until proven innocent. Now the twin condition is, the court cannot give you bail until you are innocent. But how will the court be innocent? Because you don't go into the facts of the matter in the bail hearing. You're watching DD Indian News R. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj and let's have a look at the headlines once again. At least 115 people killed, over 445 injured in one of the deadliest attacks at a concert hall in Moscow. 11 alleged suspects detained. Prime Minister Narendra Modi returns to Delhi after successful visit to Bhutan. Earlier inaugurated a state-of-the-art hospital built with India's assistance in Timphu Hospital, a shining example of India-Bhutan partnership. US Congress averts government shutdown, passes $1.2 trillion bill. Key federal agencies will remain funded through September 30th. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrived in Delhi on Saturday after a successful state visit to Bhutan. Ending the special visit with yet another special gesture, the King of Bhutan, Jigme Khesa, Namgyal Wangchuk and Prime Minister Shering Topge both came to see off PM Modi at the airport. Earlier on Saturday, India's Prime Minister Modi along with his Bhutanese counterpart Shering Topge inaugurated the Gyalswen Jetson Pema Mother and Child Hospital in Timphu. It's a state-of-the-art hospital built with India's assistance. The newly constructed hospital would add value to the quality of mother and child health services in Bhutan. The facility stands as a shining example of India-Bhutan partnership in healthcare. PM Modi was conferred with Bhutan's highest civilian award during his visit to the neighboring country. PM Modi became the first foreign head of government to receive the honor on Friday. The Order of Truk Gaalpo is a lifetime achievement award and takes precedence over all orders, decorations and medals in Bhutan. On a two-day visit to the Himalayan Kingdom, Prime Minister Modi announced further support of 10,000 crore rupees or 1.25 billion US dollars to the neighboring country's 13th development plan. Prime Minister of Bhutan, Shering Topge, extended his gratitude to India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi for rupees 10,000 crore assistance to the Himalayan nation. Bhutan was honored to receive Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji on a two-day the state visit to Bhutan. The two-day state visit couldn't have gone any better. He was welcomed with open hearts by every citizen of Bhutan. And uh, this visit, this historic visit, is going to further strengthen the already strong relations between our two countries and our two people. Well, DD India correspondent Amrit Pal Singh joins us uh, with more details. Uh, Amrit Pal, now to begin with, in a special gesture, the King of Bhutan, Jigme Kesan Namgyal Wangchuk and Prime Minister Shering Topge both came to see off PM Modi at the airport. It's unusual. I mean, you don't see that happening quite often. What does it signify, Amritpal? Amritpal, can you hear me? I believe we are trying to reconnect with a correspondent from Bhutan, uh, Amritpal Singh. Amritpal, can you hear me? All right, uh, we'll try to reconnect with a correspondent, Amritpal Singh. Meanwhile, India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, who is on a three nations visit, began his Singapore visit by paying homage to Netaji and the brave Indian National Army soldiers. Dr. S. Jai Shankar is on official visit to Malaysia, Singapore and the Philippines from March 23rd to March 27th at the invitation of his counterparts. The three-nation visit of Jai Shankar will focus on enhancing bilateral relations and would provide an opportunity for engagement on regional issues of mutual concern. 
while delivering his lecture titled on Why Bharat Matters in Singapore, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar articulated that India had demonstrated a robust foreign policy approach amidst the challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. But once we started responding, other aspects of globalization were also visible. And that too told us why foreign policy mattered, uh, which was the producing vaccines itself. We were, in a way, at the end of a complex global supply chain. And every part of that chain, which was really spread across multiple countries, had to work if vaccines were to be delivered. And one of my most uh, memorable, I mean, I would say actually honestly stressful uh, uh, memories of that period were going uh, to the US uh, in, in uh, 2021 uh, with a binder this thick about all the orders that had been placed uh, across the world, but in one way or the other, which went through the US. And, you know, until those were cleared, really the global supply chain for vaccine production wouldn't work. Jay Shankar said that the current conflicts in Ukraine and the Red Sea have affected the supply chain, impacting India's energy requirements. Now, there was a time when conflicts could happen. It could happen somewhere else, and we are in a different part of the world, and, you know, its impact on us. Yes, we read about it in the newspaper, we saw it on the television, and probably it stopped there. It may have had some consequences, maybe, on the markets. But... If one looks today, uh, whether it is the conflict in Ukraine or what is today happening in the Red Sea, we are seeing actually uh, what is an actual or potential or an averted major disruption uh, of our daily routine and actually of our way of living. Uh, in our case, I mean, uh, as, as a major energy importer, uh, when the Ukraine conflict started, I would, we saw the price of energy, price of oil, virtually double in that period. Even when it settled down finally, uh, it was about 50% higher than what it was before the conflict started. Well, we are again connected with our correspondent Amrit Pal Singh, who's there in Bhutan, as Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi returns to Delhi after his successful uh, uh, visit to Bhutan, two-day visit, in fact. Amrit Pal, uh, now I was just asking you, that in special gesture, the King of Bhutan, Jigme Khesa Namgyal Wangchuk and Prime Minister Shering Topge, they both came to see of Prime Minister Modi at the airport. It's unusual. I mean, you don't see that happening often. What does it signify? That's a special gesture, Amritpal. Uh, yes, both the King and the Prime Minister coming uh, and then, uh, you know, not just coming to the airport uh, uh, to see him off, actually climbing the ladder and going inside the plane. Now, the, I haven't uh, in uh, my, uh, you know, uh, two decades of career seen uh, that uh, any dignitary, there are dignitaries who come to see off, but go right into the plane, make him seated. So that was uh, expressing a lot of, uh, putting out a lot of bonhomie and warmth. It signifies the special relationship uh, that the two countries share, a unique and exemplary relationship. Uh, of course, there is a uh, angle of personal chemistry between the leadership of the two countries, but it also signifies, as the Prime Minister yesterday in his acceptance speech of the award said, um, uh, it's not just an award to Narendra Modi, it's an award to 140 crore Indians. And he said that when we gave you vaccines and uh, 500,000 vaccines mm. when the pandemic hit, um, if we, we, we didn't give it to you because we were uh, extending help to another neighbor. We consider you as a part of our family. Indians look at Bhutanese as the part of their family. So it's, it, it is a very unique relationship, and, uh, which uh, came out uh, by the gestures, um, the gesture, special gesture put out both by the king and uh, the prime minister of Bhutan. Definitely, like you've mentioned, you have uh, very correctly mentioned and, uh, you know, both the countries share a unique relationship. Uh, we leave it there. Thank you so much for your analysis, Amrit Pal Singh. Now, Indian naval ship Kolkata, which was deployed for anti-piracy operations, arrived in Mumbai today with 35 Somali pirates on board. The pirates were handed over to the Yellow Gate police. The ship was deployed in Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy operations. The Indian Navy intercepted the vessel with the destroyer INS Kolkata, confirming armed pirate activity on board. 
India's Chief of Naval Admiral R. Hari Kumar staff held a press conference on the Operation Sankalp, under which the rescue operation was conducted. He said that about 10 ships have been deployed in the region to keep the vessels safe from hijackings. I would say about 10 ships are present in this entire region uh, to counter all these, uh, to take part in all these three uh, tasks, anti-piracy, anti-hijacking, anti-missile and anti-drone. So, right from the uh, Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden to uh, the North Arabian Sea and to the uh, east coast of Somalia. So, this is the area that we are operating uh, where we have uh, deployed these ships. And because they are uh, deployed there, they are able to respond quickly whenever there is an attack or uh, some incident that is happening. India has lodged a strong protest with the German side on their comments on the internal events in India. According to a press release by the Ministry of External Affairs, the German Deputy Chief of Mission, George Enzweiler, in New Delhi, was summoned and conveyed India's strong protest on their Foreign Office spokesperson's comments on our internal affairs. MEA press release further stated that such remarks are seen as interfering in country's judicial process and undermining the independence of the judiciary. The ministry further said that as in all legal cases, law will take its own course in the instant matter. It called the biased assumptions made on this account as most unwarranted. All right, let's get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election in India. Six former Congress MLAs of uh, Himachal Pradesh who were disqualified as legislators joined the Bhartiya Janata Party in the national capital on Saturday. Four-time MLA Sudhir Sharma, three-time MLA Ravi Thakur, Inder Dutt Lakhanpal, first-time MLA Devendra Bhutto, Rajendra Rana and first-time MLA Chitanya Sharma joined the BJP in the presence of Himachal Pradesh BJP President and Union Minister Anurag Singh Thakur. Addressing the press conference, Union Minister welcomed all six MLAs. कांग्रेस छोड़कर आए सभी माननीय छह विधायकों का दुनिया के सबसे बड़े राजनीतिक दल भारतीय जनता पार्टी में बहुत-बहुत स्वागत और अभिनंदन करता हूं आप सब के आने के बाद भारतीय जनता पार्टी को और बल मिलेगा हिमाचल प्रदेश में हम और सशक्त होंगे जिन वायदों को करके पिछली सरकार हिमाचल प्रदेश में बनी थी वो वायदे उतने ही झूठे थे जितने वो राजस्थान और छत्तीसगढ़ में थे और आपने उन चुनावों में भी देखा लोग पूछते थे कहां गई कांग्रेस की गारंटी गारंटी वहां फेल होने के पांच साल के बाद अवसर मिला था यहां सवा साल के बाद अवसर मिल गया है और सवा साल में जब चुनाव आया राज्यसभा का तो जनता का गुस्सा इन छह विधायकों के रूप में भी देखने को मिला the EVMs or the electronic voting machines have revolutionized the election process in India and are now being used in almost all polls being conducted by the Election Commission of India. Now here's a report on the unique story of the EVMs. Electronic voting has become a hallmark of elections in India. Voting is done through the electronic voting machine or the EVM, which is a device used to electronically record and count votes. The Indian EVM system is also called ECI EVM, meaning an EVM specifically designed, manufactured indigenously and used as per the Election Commission's rule. EVMs were first used in the Parur Assembly constituency in the southern state of Kerala in 1982. They were used in all 543 lower house constituencies during the 2004 general elections. An EVM consists of the ballot unit and control unit. To make the system more transparent, the voter verifiable paper audit trail or VVPAT was introduced. It was used across all the constituencies during the 2019 general elections. So how does an EVM VVPAT work? People cast their vote by pressing the button on the ballot unit next to the name and symbol of the candidate of their choice. 
A paper slip showing the details of the candidates is generated and is visible for about 7 seconds through the transparent window of VVPAT. The ECI EVM can record a maximum of 2000 votes. To better understand EVM's efficiency, it is important to look at how they fare in comparison to paper ballots which were earlier used in general elections. Since voting is done by pressing a button, there is no invalid vote unlike the paper ballot system in which votes may become invalid due to improper marking. An EVM can record up to 4 votes per minute, giving security forces ample time to respond to any booth capturing attempt. In the paper ballot system, there have been incidents of ballot boxes being stuffed with fraudulent votes. Counting of votes recorded in EVMs usually takes less than a day, while in paper ballot systems, manual counting can last for weeks. The use of EVMs reflects the evolution of the Indian electoral process with changing times and technology. Well, tensions escalated after China's Coast Guard said it had taken control measures against Philippine vessels in disputed waters of the South China Sea on Saturday. While the Philippine Coast Guard decried the move as irresponsible and provocative, the armed forces of the Philippines reported that China Coast Guard vessels fired water cannons at a Philippine supply boat, which was on a resupply mission for Philippine troops stationed at a warship in the second Thomas Shoal. The Philippine Coast Guard said, Philippine Coast Guard vessel was impeded and encircled by one Chinese Coast Guard vessel and two Chinese maritime militia vessels. China claims almost the entire South China Sea. The Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2016 found China's sweeping claims have no legal basis. And still to come on DD Indian News R. Arena Sabalenka makes winning start at Miami Open. Euro 2024 Trophy Tour kicked off in Stuttgart in Germany with just less than 100 days left until the start of EuroCup. You said that uh, Indian uh, ethos and uh, conceptualization of society, nation, state, governance all these you know fundamental concepts of public life you said that they are distinct and they are quite uh, different and drawn from our traditions our rise should be not just a photocopy of a western or european nation but india should rise as its own real with its own real identity which we call it bharat You're watching DD India News R. I am Siddharth Bharatwaj. The Embassy of India celebrated the 59th Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Day in Kathmandu. Around 300 guests, including several members of parliament, senior government officials, ITEC alumni, and prominent Nepalese alumni of academic institutions from India attended the celebrations. The ITEC program is built on India's vast and rich network of governance and development related expertise in more than 160 plus partner countries including Nepal. It has been utilized by more than 200,000 government officials, professionals and senior industry representatives around the world. India has always followed the policy of Vasudev Kutumbakam in its foreign policy which is the world is a family. That has been supplemented by Prime Minister Modi's vision of Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas or Sabka Prayas. California-based tech joint NVIDIA showcased its next-generation graphic processing units, GPUs, and AI platforms at its annual technology conference. The work of a research team from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Madras, was highlighted at the event. NVIDIA supports the research conducted by the Center for Computation Brain Research at IIT Madras by providing computing hardware, computational systems, domain-specific libraries, curated deep learning models, and other tools. This support is crucial for the Center's large-scale multidisciplinary effort to map more than 100 human brains at a cellular level. 
NVIDIA Vice President of Healthcare Kimberly Powell praised the work being done by the Center for Computational Brain Research at IIT Madras. We have an amazing collaboration with IIT Madras and their computational brain research. They are announcing this week in their downstairs, or excuse me, across the hall in our exhibit hall um, with it, their incredible new brain research platform called Neuro Voyager. This team at IIT Madras is literally imaging the brain at the cellular level. Hundred, about a hundred brains, I think they're up to 50 today going to a hundred creating not each brain image has well over between two and three petabytes of data. We've worked with them to um, digitize that data and be able to visualize that data in its complete volume at any kind of slice level that you wish at any kind of resolution all the way down to a half a micron. This is a, a never before done uh, type of data set. Um, this data is so complex, we're going to discover new things about the brain that we never have before. They're making this globally available. And they're doing some other amazing things so that we can expedite researchers' exploration and understanding about the brain. Um, they're going to use Monai, and they're using Monai to segment the brain so that it's very easily navigatable, and you can understand um, what these anatomy and these pieces are in the brain. And then they're also doing something that is very, very helpful, is they're putting a chat front end on it. And this chat front end does everything from connects to all of the last 10 years of brain research so you can ask it questions and it can summarize for you on a very evidence-based manner. What are the papers that are talking about this particular phenomenon? Time now for sport updates uh, and Punjab Kings won the toss and elected to field against Delhi Capitals in match two of the ongoing IPL 2024 season in Mullanpur. Both the teams will hope to start their campaign with a bang. Last season, the Shikhar Dhawan led side finished eighth in the points table. Liam Livingston, Johnny Besto, Sam Curran and Kagiso Rabada are their overseas players. On the other hand, the Capitals also had a poor run in 2023 season as they finished at the ninth position. New captain Rishabh Pant will hope to make a brilliant comeback after prolonged injury. David Warner, Mitchell Marsh, Shea Hope and Tristan Stubbs are DC's overseas players. Two-time champion Kolkata Knight Riders will take on Sunrisers Hyderabad in their opening encounter at the Eden Gardens in Kolkata on Saturday. Led by the returning Shreya Sayer, KKR will be hoping for a better season this time out after missing out on the playoff spots in 2023. Australian pacer Mitchell Stark will also return after a gap of eight IPL seasons. The last time Stark featured in the IPL was in 2015. Playing for RCB, he had picked up 20 wickets in 13 games at an economy of 6.76. SRH, on the other hand, have assembled a strong core of foreign cricketers and will be hopeful that new captain Pat Cummins can inspire the team to success in the upcoming season. Indian shuttler Kidambi Srikanth brushed past Lee Chia Hao 21-10, 21-14 in just 35 minutes to enter the semi-finals of Swiss Open. Srikanth, who had struggled to put together back-to-back -to -back wins on the BWF Tour for months now, looked in great touch against the Chinese Taipei player who, has beaten, who had beaten, in fact, Lakshya Sen in pre-quarters. He will take on Chinese, Chinese Taipei's Lin Chun Yi in the semi-finals. World number two, Arena Sabalenka made a stoic return to the court as she eased past Paula Badosa 6 4 6 3 to reach the third round of the Miami Open. While clearly not at her sharpest, the Australian Open champion still seemed relieved to be back on the court and she made quick work of her Spanish opponent. In other action, third seeded American Coco Goff sped into the third round with 6 1 6 2 demolition of Argentine qualifier Nadia Podroska. In men's single, Czech Thomas Mashak stunned Russian fifth seed Andrei Rublev in straight sets to advance to the Miami Open third round. Mashak ranked 60th in the world, powered to a 6-4, 6-4 victory just before a heavy downpour caused the suspension of play. 
Now, with less than 100 days until the official start of the Euro Cup in Germany, tournament director Philipp Lahm kicked off a trophy tour with Euro 2024 trophy in Stuttgart on Friday. The trophy will visit 10 German cities hosting matches during the tournament. Lahm said the goal was for people to come together even in these challenging times and celebrate together again. The start of the tour comes a day after a surprise announcement by the German Football Association to end their 77-year-long sponsorship with German sportswear company Adidas and switch to Nike in 2027. The colourful festival of Holi was celebrated by the Indian Cultural Association in collaboration with the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Centre in Sri Lanka's Colombo. The event saw the enthusiastic participation of several hundred members of the Indian diaspora and local Sri Lankan residents. The colourful festival of Holi was celebrated by the Indian Cultural Association in collaboration with Swami Vivekananda Cultural Centre in Sri Lanka's Taj Vivanta at Colombo. Several hundred members of Indian diaspora and Sri Lankan nationals joined in the celebrations. Uh, today we are celebrating Holi 2024. Uh, with around uh, 350 people in here, a mixture of Indian and uh, Sri Lankans, a good friend of ours. We have actually flown in 40 kilos of gulal, that is the colors, and as well as uh, tandais, mitapan and all the masalas, kalakatas and everything, and we are doing it in Taj Vivanta. For the occasion, the Indian Cultural Association made elaborate arrangements including flying in Gulal from India, apart from arranging Indian cuisine. Plays on Bhakt Prahlad and Lord Krishna were also performed before the celebrations. The Festival of Colours was marked by everyone joining in splashing colours on one another and exchanging greetings. For DD India, Ahmed Moin Farouti from Colombo. That's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect uh, with us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.